Today on CityCast Denver, El Chapultepec is back, but this time the iconic jazz bar is simultaneously living two new lives. The El Chapultepec brand is on a piano bar inside the DCPA. Meanwhile, the old peck is revving up too, with one-off concerts and community events led by musician and philosopher Stefan Brackett. A few months ago, I sat down with Stefan, my friend and fellow George Washington High School alum. He told me it's not just about throwing parties. He founded a nonprofit, now called One Denver, dedicated to creating a safer nightlife scene for everyone. Since we spoke, Brackett served as co-chair of Mayor Mike Johnston's Transition Committee for Arts and Venues, where he pitched his idea for an Office of Nighttime Economy. Westward reported that, quote, there was encouragement and openness to pursue this possibility, but many were not familiar with this type of role. So please enjoy this conversation and familiarize yourself. Today is Monday, October 30th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Stefan Brackett, welcome to CityCast Denver. I am so excited to be here. So we're sitting inside El Chapultepec right now? Yes. Um, why am I sitting in here with you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not complaining. Yeah. We've known each other for a million years. A very long time. We know the music scene really well. Yeah. We're in a place that people would know for music. But I have to tell you, it does not look like El Chapultepec right now. It does not look like El Chapultepec. And... Um, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that El Chapultepec did legitimately die mm-hmm. during quarantine. Yeah. The family that had been running it decided that like they'd they were tired of dealing with all the things that go with it and then um just like wanted to just let it go at that point in time. And so I, with a bunch of other people in the city, with thousands of people, probably tens of thousands of people in the world, <laughs> mourned the yeah. loss of something that I think kind of identified what Denver is at its best. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we're here now is that through a bunch of amazing twists and turns, the nonprofit that I'm working with has the lease to what the PEC was for the next year. And we have a lot of things that we want to do with it. Um, But one of the things we want to be able to do is make the argument for places like the PEC and, and like kind of in some ways tell the story of what we are losing and losing places like the Peck and how we can't afford almost from a music ecosystem perspective as a culture ecosystem perspective to lose any more places like this. So sort of preventative measures. Preventative measures and then also saying like, how do we build other ones? Okay. Um, and But tell me again, so tell me about your your nonprofit you mentioned that's got a lease on this space for the yes. next year. Mm-hmm. What is it called? What are, you, what are you all doing with it? Okay, well, since you, you've known me forever, um, I am a Denver kid who feels as though this city's really invested in me Mm. um, over the 44 years that I've been here. And it's my duty and responsibility to pay that forward. So my band Flowbots created the organization that's now Youth on Record. And now I'm at this phase where I'm like, okay, well, what next? Yeah. So for folks that don't know, Youth on Record brings artists teaching artists into schools to teach kids music, but also the history of music and activism and how to write and brings them into the studio at Youth on Record and teaches them how to use a soundboard. And Mm -hmm. I mean, so many other things, but that came from you Mm -hmm. and and some of your bandmates at Flowbots. Yes. With Flowbots. And so now you're, you're in another phase of, (laughs) you're you're starting another nonprofit. I'm starting another nonprofit. I don't know what I'm doing, but like, but it's just, I, it's and made it, it's made me a student of the pipeline. And so I'm like, okay, well, where where are we releasing these kids to? Mm. What is the the playground that's in the city? What what is what are the opportunities here? Um and having been here long enough, I just see that this is kind of becoming a sundown town for teenagers. Would and, you explain that a little bit yes, for someone who yes, doesn't know absolutely. the Absolutely. So term? Like, so sundown towns were something that you'd find a lot of times especially in the Jim Crow South, but you'd find them in other cities throughout, throughout America where It was fine for black people to be around, but after sundown, there were no protections for you. It was fair game. It was borderline the purge Mm. for black people in the streets after sundown. So like no kind of protections, nothing there for you. And so what I'm saying in the same way is that for young people to be in downtown Denver, it's a place where they're not welcome. Yeah. You'll just find like, and I'm, I'm struggling when I walk through the city to find places that have actually been built for young people to explore and like figure out what they like to do and enjoy. And that, 
relax. What do they do with all that pent up energy? They've been in school all day. Like, oh, wait, they're supposed to do homework and then just go to bed? Or like, maybe they've just gotten off of a job? Because when we were kids, I remember when they brought in the curfew on the parks. Yeah. And I got a loitering ticket. Oh, all of us (laughs) for playing on the swing sets. Like, 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 like all of these things. But like, but then we had Denny's and we had Paris on the Platte and we had the spot and we had all of these different places, specifically in downtown Denver. There were several like drop in centers for kids just to go and hang out and just be. And also sort of unofficial youth uh, centered businesses. Like yes. you said, Paris on the Platte, mm-hmm. Cafe Euphrates was a restaurant that let kids book punk shows. Yes. And Mercury Cafe, obviously still around. But so what do you want to do? What are, uh, is that what you want to do in this space we're in right now? Like, so your your new nonprofit is called the 87. Foundation. Foundation. Yes. What do you want to, is that what you want to create? What do you want to do? <sighs> it depends on, do you want the real answer? Do you want like the, the rosy nonprofit answer? No, I want your answer, Stefan. I, your... I, I want to make this city a place that makes sense. A place that actually welcomes us. Like I, I want, I want a city that isn't just marketing to 25 to 35 year old white kids Mm -hmm. and that's it that's not who lives here that's not the 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 sum total of it and i am seeing a city that continues to lose ground so when i'm talking about how do we make opportunities available for young people this it's because young people the canary in the coal mine of any kind of city if we're not building anything for them then that means we're not building anything that retains talent that means that we're making that we're we're not taking serious the impacts of recreation on mental health and resilience and especially for young people coming out of covid like if we have no place for them to play then we don't have a place for them to live Mm -hmm. and in this big picture kind of way i really really want to be able to make a plan for the night time experience of this city because I've lived here my entire life and there never has been one. I remember going into downtown Denver 15 years ago and at the t- at the rooftop of Club Bash, you'd have SWAT teams every weekend yeah, with, with tear gas out, yeah. and then and shotguns filled with bean bags yeah. because like these kids from the suburbs were wiling out to such a degree it was called the wildings. Mm-hmm. Every weekend that was happening. And I remember then there's points in times where like you would have um, like different gang initiations where like folks would just beat up the unhoused on a regular basis, like back in the early nineties or just like how, like how little people have ever felt that this is a safe place for them. This particular, I mean, like really we're talking about the heart of downtown, Yes, which is as you and I know um, has become more appealing and more attractive in the last couple of, I mean, decade or so to where people want to come back to downtown. Yeah even though there's always been people downtown. I want to be clear about that. It's not like it wasn't, but it was a different experience. But, you know, someone would say, well, Stefan, there's plenty of money pouring into this city. There's plenty of places, there's venues, there's, there's bars. What do you want to do? So while there are plenty of places, all of these places that are coming up are pretty much on the same business model. They're catering to the very narrow demographic and if there aren't venues or bars or restaurants that are catering to that demographic, then everything else is being used for high density housing at a very high price. With that kind of being the priority of the city for the last 15 years, that means that all of these other in-between transitional spaces cannot exist. Now, when we start looking at the data behind city planning and all of these things, any other country that you go to, when you go to like some city center, some event place, it will be multi-use. It'll be a town square in Rwanda. It will be like a, um, a little family plex in France. I don't care, but you see this all over the place where it's like, oh, there's a pretzel stand that's open till 11 and an ice cream parlor. And then like um, uh, places you can get coffee 24 hours and there's a bar and there's a restaurant and all these things. And then it's activated from like 11 in the morning till two at night and the city shows up there. Um, what do you mean? How does the city show up there? Like the people? Yes, the people. Like you're okay, seeing. Okay, we like, show up there. Like we, you see large swaths and demographics participating in it, and it's not even paradoxically. It's just like only in America is it paradoxically. Like when you open it up for all these people, it actually becomes safer. Yeah. Now, when you just select only for a small group, 
And it's all, all of the profit is pretty much predicated on selling alcohol, yeah. which is the one drug that's most linked to violence and all these behaviors. When you narrow the focus, we're just finding in general um, across the United States of America, this kind of, of tuning only to that is, is giving us this result. And Denver, Colorado has been a city that has never had a nighttime economy plan. There are cities that have. We're at the point now where there's uh, 14 cities throughout the United States of America that have night managers or nightmares or bar czars. And there's about another 12 that within the next year have that office of, of nighttime economy developing. Part of the 87 Foundation model is saying, how do we get to the point of actually building a plan? Because any plan is better than no plan. This episode is brought to you by Ednium. Ednium is an action-focused community development organization that partners with recent public school alumni to change the way our city educates and reinvests in its homegrown talent. With the Denver Public Schools Board of Education election right around the corner, Ednium has sat down with each candidate to hear their stories and their vision for the future of the district. So if you want a different perspective than you'll get on the campaign trail, check out the DPS Board of Education Candidate Series wherever you get your podcasts. Again, that's Ednium, E-D-N-I-U-M, wherever you get your podcasts. Note, Ednium is a 501c3 and does not endorse any candidate, and all candidates were invited to participate in this series. So let's go back just a little bit for someone who's like, what is a nighttime economy? Does that yes. just mean business is open at night? Pretty much. Anything that's pretty much operating and making money after 5 p.m. Uh, the real challenge of nighttime economy and why it's such an important framing is that during nighttime economy, there's also one-fifth of the services to support it. So daytime economy will have all of these other things operating at the same time. Nighttime economy, it's one-fifth. So that comes from like transportation to, yes, police to anything. So with that lack of services, but still like bringing in money, commerce, and bringing people into it without a plan, it makes for a perfect situation of things to fall apart, which is where I think we are right now. So it's kind of falling apart because <clears throat> I'm thinking about, like you said, transportation. So limited bus service downtown, for instance, maybe you won't go downtown to go to something because you won't be able to get back by the time it's over. Um, but I guess I'm wondering how this, how you see expanding the nighttime economy or making it better, how does that make it safer? How does that make downtown safer? So I am talking to people with a whole bunch of resource who own bars and clubs and feeling like they can't do anything to make their place safer. Like they're calling the police, the police don't show up, da 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 all these things. I've sat through some of these community meetings, but I'm also sitting back through these community meetings and being like, the data also shows that police presence doesn't actually make things safer. Now you've got these bar owners feeling very disempowered and nobody's listening to them. Okay. But on the other side, if we actually train them in talking about nighttime economy and actually giving them an opportunity to come together and bring their voices together, then they can actually start looking at what kind of interventions can they actually implement that can make them safer and then in which ways do they actually need the city to change certain policies that can also help them be safer. Um, I was talking to one of the club owners like across the street the other day and he was talking about, like, yeah, I was finding that like, I have police officers there and like we still have the same amount of fights. So I switched it and hired a security company. And I sat down and I trained the security company and my staff in how we relate with our clientele. Like ways that we talk and the ways that we approach folks and how, trying to make every opportunity an opportunity to de-escalate. And as complicated as that sounds, a lot of it is just basic hospitality. He hasn't seen a single violent action since he's taken over the bar and he's retrained his, his staff. Whereas before, there were three to four fights every night during the weekend with the old model, with the police, and with, with this kind of adversarial um, relationship with the clientele that the staff had that they didn't know that they were operating with, right? So what does nighttime economy conversations do? Well, it allows an actual opportunity for people to come together and share best practices. Because right now what we have is people stumbling through and trying to find them. Yeah, And um, I think it's really important that when we're talking about safety, um, I'm trying to be very clear that we're not talking about policing. Now, I'm not saying that the police don't have a role in it in some ways, but 
a whole bunch of policing is not going to make my community come down here and feel safe. It's going to be um, aspects of the community and aspects of this place that are actually open to them. So one, if every time you're walking down the street, you don't see somebody getting their butt kicked, that will make a big difference. But then two, um, one of the things that we're hoping to do with having the 87 Foundation here and in the PEC, we will be able to have the kind of events for our communities that have often felt marginalized in the project of modern downtown and be able to say like, here will be a place for us that is safe. Um, but I'm thinking about, so I know El Chapultepec, one of the things they struggled with is like when you step outside the doors of this historic jazz club, yes. it's a weekend, it's a, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's, or it's like a, it's a, it's a Rockies game yeah. let out and you have like a bunch of crazy drunk fans interacting with like people that came to see jazz and they were just tired of like, not saying that those folks aren't welcome, but it's like a different set kind of energy. And I just struggle with like, how do we you can't just be like, no bros allowed in this no, place, no. you know, because that's not ultimately solving the problem. The problem solving would be like, bros are welcome, but we're all on the same page about how we treat each other. Here. Yes. And so like, to be perfectly honest, um, we're actually taking advantage of the fact that this is not a venue right now. Um, when we're going to be doing our events, we're actually, it's going to be by like membership and the membership's not exclusive. But the whole purpose of the membership is that you're actually buying into a set of values and a responsibility when you come into this space. And so once we get our membership platform up, like let's say I give you, I send you a membership thing. And that means you get to invite two other people, right? But you are also responsible for those two people. And if they end up acting the fool, I will talk to you about those two people and we will have a conversation about can they come back to the space. We have to kind of demonstrate what we're looking for and also understand the water that we're swimming in. We're not going to have an event here the same night as a Rockies game. Sure. Um, sure. Just, it's, yes, we'd love to see certain things like change, but we're also not going to be unrealistic about what that means. Stefan Brackett, thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed this show, why not take a minute to tell Paul's server at Molotov Kitchen and Cocktails about us. Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See ya. See ya.